Thanks, neighbor. Thanks for inviting me, and uh, and thank you all for coming. And uh, and by the way, I don't know what that guy did uh, that would warrant a trial, because you know, the Constitution defines treason as uh, levying war upon the states or giving aid and comfort to their enemies. And, uh, you know, what state was he levying war against? Uh, I mean, in, individually, like Maryland, Virginia, that's what it says. So he was just sort of bitching and complaining about the U.S. government is pretty much what he was doing, and so they killed him for that. But anyway, anyway that's, that's, that's beside the point. Uh, Tabor asked me to give a talk on um, why the stimulus doesn't work, and, uh, and so that's sort of a, kind of an easy topic uh, for me. But, uh, but uh, for the average citizen out there, there's such a cloud of BS coming from Washington, D.C. about this all the time that it, it actually is hard to understand what the heck is going on if you haven't actually studied economics or if you haven't looked at it in a long time. But if, if prior to the 1930s, if, if anybody would have said to any economist, you know, uh, the way to create prosperity and jobs is to have the government spend a lot of money, they would have been laughed, laughed their heads off. They were the most absurd thing they ever heard because everybody understood uh, at the time that, of course, the government has no money of its own. If it's going to spend, it has to take it. It has to take it from somebody uh, one way or the other. It has to, it has to tax us, uh, or it can borrow, but then it crowds out private borrowing by businesses and homeowners and other people. Or it can print money, and, of course, that creates price inflation, and that uh, reduces the value of pro all privately held wealth. And so one way or another, the government takes money out of the private sector, and all that money that would have been spent in the private sector is not spent there. And therefore, it creates unemployment in the private sector, although it expands the government. More bureaucrats on one hand, but more unemployment in the private sector on the other hand. So not only does so whatever you want to call it, I don't call it stimulus spending, I call it government spending, uh, it not only does not create jobs, it destroys jobs. It destroys because the private sector is the sole source of genuine job creation. That is, job creation based on providing a good or service to your fellow man. That's what we do when we work in the private sector. And it's all based on consumer demand. It's all based on what economists call consumer sovereignty. Whereas when government spends money, it's all based on the whims and daydreams of politicians. And there's, there's no way, there's no mechanism that we have, like the market, in politics to tell politicians what we want as consumers. Uh, we, we have elections. We don't, we don't go to government every day and shop around and see, let's see, I'll take this much defense today or that much uh, EPA today and how much is the EPA today. We don't do that. We have elections every once in a while so that the government can fool us into thinking we have something to do with, uh, with, uh, with the government. Uh, but, of course, the system is grossly rigged. Uh, if you were to go online and Google congressional incumbent re-election rates, you'll find these charts that show for the past 50 years the average has been about 95% uh, because of gerrymandering of the sort you were talking about earlier with this, uh, this map and other, other gimmicks that Congress has used. Yes, they let us vote, uh, and as my friend Robert Higgs says, they also allow us to have free speech. Uh, why is that? Well, because they know it doesn't matter. For the most part, that's why they let us have free speech. You know, talk all you want, and then they and they just sort of, you know, thumb their noses at us out of Washington. But uh, but on on the, the whole issue of government spending, like I said, prior to the 1930s, uh, you would have been laughed out of town uh, at an economics convention if you proposed this. But uh, the, the but then came a, a very popular book by John Maynard Keynes, the, the British economist, called The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Income. And it provided a, a sophisticated sounding rationale for government spending uh, to, get the, uh, to get the nations uh, who were in a depression out of the depression. Uh, Keynes was a famous Cambridge University economist. He had made a lot of money himself on the stock markets. Uh, he, he had been an advisor to the British government during the uh, meetings over the Versailles Treaty at the end of World War I. He wrote a famous book, uh, uh, on the consequences of the Versailles Treaty, predicting it would lead to another war in Europe, uh, you know, shortly after the treaty. And so he was, he was what, arguably the most famous intellectual in the world at the time, uh, or at least on the top five or six. And so, and so he handed to politicians, right in the middle of the Great Depression, a sophisticated-sounding and looking rationale 
for why uh, they should uh, ignore all these people who, uh, for a couple hundred years, uh, would laugh at the idea that government can create jobs out of thin air by simply spending money. Why? Uh, you know, think about it. It's like it is though you're saying, okay, we have a swimming pool. Here's the deep end over here. Here's the shallow end. What we're going to do is we're going to take a bucket of water out of the deep end and we're going to dump it into the shallow end. And as a result, the overall level will rise. That's what they're saying. That, that's essentially what, what people are saying when they're saying government spending can, can increase economic growth and, and, uh, and create jobs. Uh, but Keynes came up with this very convoluted, almost impossible to understand book. I remember reading it in graduate school, the first, my first semester in graduate school, and I, I found an article that Keynes wrote in an, in an academic journal that was clear as a bell. It was about a 20-page article that explained everything he had to say, clear as a bell. But the book was just it's impossible. I don't think anyone to this day has ever understood all of that, what was in that book, because there's almost no economics in it. It's sort of part engineering, a little bit of uh, sort of elementary schoolish math and, and uh, sort of junior high level geometry. Anyone who's ever taken an economics course has suffered through, the, through this stuff. And, and it has all sorts of uh, superstitions, like one of them is, uh, is called the balanced budget multiplier. And the bottom line behind this theory, the balanced budget multiplier, through some slick mathematical manipulation, you can show that if the government – taxes a billion dollars away from the taxpayers, and then it spends the billion dollars, the economy will actually grow. GDP will actually increase by, say, 1.8 billion, something like that. So, and so you think about the implication of that. If that's true, if the government can take a billion dollars from us and turn it into $2 billion, why don't we send all of our paychecks to Washington, D.C., and then just sit back and let the good times roll, they'll, they'll come back at a 150% of what we sent to Washington. That's, that's the implication. But generations of college students were taught this nonsense uh, uh, from, because of Keynes, but it was all used to justify what politicians always want to do anyway, uh, spend other people's money to get themselves reelected. And so uh, here, here they were in the middle of the Great Depression, 1936. So it was, you know, a year... You know, 1929 was a stock market crash, so it's year seven of the Great Depression, and they're, they're suffering from the Obama syndrome. That is, you just can't get that unemployment rate down. Unemployment was still 15, 17, 18 percent, and, you know, what can we do? What can we do? Uh, and, and at the time, of course, everyone understood that government spending uh, isn't, isn't doing the trick. Uh, and so they got... Uh, uh, rescued by Keynes. And by the way, the first New Deal, 1933 to 1935, didn't really focus that much on stimulus spending. It was mostly an attempt to create one giant uh, cartel in the U.S. economy. The, uh, the government, the National Recovery Act, uh, uh, fixed prices in manufacturing. People went to jail for cutting their prices. Uh, during that time. The same with agriculture. They, they try to prop up the price of agriculture, uh, uh, of farm products, under the harebrained theory that the cause of the Great Depression was low prices. Therefore, if the government can force up prices, it will end the Great Depression. And, but that was all ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court in 1935. And so it was uh, after 35 where the real big spending programs really got revved up, and 36 was Keynes' famous book. So the timing was just perfect. Uh, uh, even though, uh, uh, you know, the economics profession didn't really embrace it, uh, the, uh, you know, at the time. The politicians surely did at the time. And so that, that's where this idea comes from. But, but, of course, and it was put into full play. Roosevelt ended up uh, employing about 10 million people uh, in public works programs. That was his stimulus pro program. And yet, uh, on the eve of World War II in 1940, the unemployment rate was still almost 15%. And uh, it, uh, it, on the eve of the uh, stock market crash, the unemployment rate in 1929 was 2.9%. That was sort of what unemployment was before the Great Depression started, call it 3%. So after employing 10 million people in make-work jobs, including such things as painting fake doors on buildings, things like that, digging holes, filling them up again, uh, t today we call it uh, uh, you know, road repair. <laughs> Pretty much, you know, you know, dig up all the roads, repave them again. Dig up all the roads, repave them again. And uh, when I was in Washington in February, the, the, uh, the, the reflecting pool, the big pool down there on Capitol Hill was empty. And there was a gigantic sign thanking President Obama for creating jobs. 
And they literally hired somebody, empty the pool, clean it up, fill it up again, and it created jobs, just like magic. Yeah. 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 So, uh, okay, so so it didn't work during the Great Depression, despite everything John Maynard Keynes had to say, uh, because, you know, economists call this the the principle of opportunity cost. It's it's sort of should be the first thing you would ever learn if you take a course in economics uh, anywhere. Or, uh, you know, if you want to read one book uh, to learn basic economics, read uh, Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. It's Ron Paul's favorite economics book uh, as far as introductory books are are concerned. And it's online for free. And I even brought you a... uh, uh, his most famous chapter from that, uh, an excerpt from it uh, right here. He also but, uh, had it for sale for $10. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we had the book for sale right there.